Hello and welcome to Tools in the Shed, a podcast powered by Cars Guide, ready to rip into car stuff that has caught our eye this week. I'm Cars Guide Deputy Editor James, and with me is News Editor Tool. Good day. And key contributor, Chesto. Hello, everyone. This week, we're looking at potential replacements for irreplaceable Aussie-made cars. Um, It's a Byron story, so it's got to be good. And uh, we'll discuss a trio of recent recent entries to the Cars Guide garage. And we'll catch up with a man who some see as an entrepreneurial genius and visionary, while others ask, can't we do better than this bloke? In this week's... (laughs) Must watch. <laughs> um, YouTubers, you can jump ahead courtesy of the time codes in the notes below, and you can click on the chapter markers in the timeline. So let's go. And as mentioned, this was a story authored by our own Byron Matthew Darkus during the week. And it's for people who might be missing, um, you know, the Ford Territory and the, the Commodore and the Falcon and the Holden Caprice. You can't walk down to the dealership um, in anywhere to get one of those. Holden dealerships don't exist anymore and locally made cars uh, don't exist anymore either. So people who own those models, the most recent Australian made car you've got is getting on, you know, it's three years, more than three years old. You've got to replace it. Maybe you want to put it in the shed and and hope it's an appreciating asset, but you need to replace it as a day-to-day driver. So Byron put up some alternatives in the current new car market as logical, desirable replacements for those Aussie-made cars. And he came up with half a dozen scenarios, and I thought we'd walk through them, and it'd be a good point of discussion um, for the podcast. So to kick it off, said, on the way out, you've got a 2011 to 2016 Ford SZ Territory turbo diesel. And his replacement for that is the upcoming Toyota Kluger, which is a GX hybrid, um, and you're looking at about $54,000 before on-road costs for this Kluger. And he says it's going to be the thing that brings them together, the Territory and the Kluger, mm-hmm. is their dynamic performance, that the Territory was a good car to drive mm-hmm. and that this new Kluger is going to be on the TNGA platform, which, mm-hmm. you know, barring any uh, catastrophes, will mean that this car will be nice to drive. What do you make of that matchup, Tom? Uh, I think it's a good it's a good matchup. Uh, I, I, you know that diesel uh, territory, uh, the, the fuel economy offered in that car, and the uh, hybrid Luger as well. They're, they're also a good matchup. But I I put a different car up there. I think I'd go uh, maybe a Mazda CX eight. Yep. Uh, it's offered with a, a two point two liter diesel, uh, one hundred forty kilowatts, four hundred fifty newton meters. That's as much you know power and torque as uh, their BT fifty ute. Uh, so it's pretty punchy off the line, and it offers you know seating per seven, mm. um, and it's comfortable. It, it it drives really well too, and um, you've got the uh, diesel power plant. Yes, well, it's interesting yeah. because Byron in his story mentioned CX nine, mm. and said yeah you get the 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 fun to drive aspect, but no no frugality. You know the the yep. the um, territory diesel was always so very good on fuel. So that's an interesting one. What do you make of it, Chesto? I'm with him on the Kluger, actually, mate, to be honest. I just think there's something kind of, it, it does almost feel like a spiritual successor to the territory, <laughs> more so than, than perhaps a Mazda Tung, no disrespect. Yeah. Um, and I also think it's going to be very good. I also know that it has had a lot of Australian input in its engineering from our, from our centre in Altona. So, yeah, I think in a lot of ways, actually, it is a kind of, to be, if I'm being totally honest with you, Toyotas have almost become the new homegrown car, haven't they? Cars built for Australian conditions, mm. partly designed and engineered in Australia. So it's yes. the reason that the Kluger is the is a suitable replacement. And I think it's going to be pretty damn good. Yep. Okay. That's good. Um, we'd like to hear your thoughts, people listening and viewing um, on that one. Next is, okay, the Commodore. A VF <laughs> Commodore SS was a 2013 to 2017 proposition. So yes, those cars, the, even the newest ones are four years old now. And Byron's proposed replacement is none other than a Chrysler 300 SRT. Mm. <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. Now that's a car that in itself has been around for 11 years, but it's that muscle car, big V8 up front, driving the rear wheels at the back. Um, and he actually makes the point, uh, he, I bet you wish you could have, you know, you, you could have bought a brand new SS sedan for 50K back in 2017. And you're probably kicking yourself that you didn't. 
um, because they're, they're very much in hot demand at the moment. But um, he's put the Chrysler up. What do we make of that? I'm going to go with a no on that one, my friend. So replacing a, v, a, a V8 rear drive sedan with a V8 rear drive sedan is a bit like saying I'm going to replace lead paint with asbestos. People just didn't. People weren't <laughs> buying that. That's perfect. That's perfect. perfect. Yeah. Suitable replacement for that is some kind of mid-size SUV. And you know how I know that? Because that's what eventually killed that car. Yes. <laughs> So, yeah, I, I think uh, that the, the time of the of the big bustering rear rear drive V eight it's behind us. I'm afraid there really is no replacement. If you've got one, put it in a shed. Yes, See, I I think I take a bit of a different approach to that. I think the appeal of a Commodore SS was affordable, cheap V eight performance. And there's only one other car on the market that offers that right now, and it's Ford Mustang. And I know they're from oh. you know, two different brands. I get it. One's a sedan, one's a coupe, but uh, you know they offer the same sort of thrill and excitement and V8 growl. Yeah. So actually, I'm changing my answer. I've figured it out. Ram 1500 V8. That's the, hey. that is the actual replacement for that vehicle. I see. Very but good. But if you have an SS, park it up because I think you'll be in, uh, in, mm -hmm. in the years to come. It's interesting, Tung, you mentioned the afford you mentioned the word affordable. Um, you know, the 300 SRT is from 77, a bit over $77,000. So um, it's a slightly pricier proposition. And you're talking about underpinnings that are still harking back to older E-Class and S-Class in terms of suspension design. It's, it is an old car. It's 11, it, you know, it's a, an older 2010 kind of car. I wrote a lot of stories about the New South Wales police fleet being updated and all the testing that underwent, all the cars underwent. And, and a bit like you, JC, I think a lot of us kind of thought, oh, well, the, you know, the Chrysler has got the V8 and the rear wheel drive, but will it be able to stand up to the rigorous testing? The answer was, yeah, it outperformed almost everything in the in the police testing, hence the reason they're now on the fleet. Yep. So it is an old platform, but it's 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 fairly uh, solid. Yep. And it is, and it remains a lot of car for the money. It's just not the right car for the times. Sure, that, sure. That eventually got the Commodore as well, didn't it? That's true. And, you know, the tail of the tape is in these sales numbers each month. Mm -hmm. um, yes, and it wouldn't make great reading if people are focused on selling Chrysler 300 SITs. No, that's right. Yeah. Um, all right, next cab off the rank. Ford, talking about an XR6 Falcon Turbo. <laughs> And not surprisingly, it's kind of in a similar vein, I suppose. Byron's put up the Kia Stinger V6 twin turbo, uh, $53,830 before on-road costs. Mm -hmm. um, and he makes the point that it is just extraordinary that Kia has put this, has produced this car mm -hmm. at all. It kind of came out of nowhere. No one was really yelling for Kia to make this kind of vehicle. Um, alternately, people are saying you need to you need to make that Ute that you're working on um, happen yesterday. No one was calling out for this car. It's nothing short of remarkable, totally. but it, it's as, probably as close as we've come so far to a replacement for people who want a family sedan with some kind of sporting intent or some kind of driving engagement as part of the brief. But is is there a difference between a realistic replacement, like a like for like replacement? And a philosophical replacement or a right. spiritual replacement. Because Great point. We, yep. we all kind of build that Kia as the replacement to cars like the Commodore mm. or Falcon. Um, but it just wasn't seen that way necessarily by the owners. People people who would have spent the money on a on a rear drive Falcon or Commodore perhaps didn't see the Kia badge quite the same way. Yes. Um, so I, I, it is, while mechanically, you know, it's the most similar replacement, is it really a spiritual successor to that car? I, I don't sure. know. Sure. Well, it's interesting because um, Byron did make the point he said they both have kind of a blue collar appeal mm. in that they're not they're not um, fancy they're not kind of upscale they're very much your your every person kind of vehicle i think that's mm. true mm. yeah that's true definitely yeah yeah it's it's certainly the uh, a pretty cost effective way to get into a vehicle like that too and and i, I agree with you completely james the, the fact that kia did it deserves a round yeah. of applause yes how about you tom well, I took a bit of a different uh, tack to that. You know, I always saw the <laughs> XR6 <surprise>. Turbo. <laughs> the XR6 Turbo, to me, has always it, it has always appealed to me because of its tunability. You know, that that yep. uh, Barra engine was great. You know, you see you tune, you throw a few mods at it, and it really sort of opens up. And there's really only one other sort of large sedan uh, on the market now that fits that brief. And I'm going to put it out there, Skoda Superb 206 four-wheel drive. 
Yeah, wow. I get it. It's okay. completely out of left field, but it uses, you know, Volkswagen Group's EA AAA engine. Uh, it's the same, you know, drivetrain as a Golf R. You know, you put, you throw a new ECU at it and you can easily get, you know, 50, 60, 70 extra kilowatts out of it. So if you want a, a large family sedan that's comfortable and you want to do a bit of mods, uh, you want to have a, a bit of fun with it, you know, you go a superb 206. Fantastic. Good call. Very interesting. Interesting. Uh, I, I actually, you know what? Very rarely here, I'm going to say I'm with Tom on this. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Now that's good. So that's three down. Next one, a VF Holden Ute. So an SV6 specifically. So that again is a 2013 to 27 model. Uh, now Byron is putting up the Ford Ranger XLT double cab and with that twin turbo four cylinder uh, diesel engine. Now, and he, he owns up to saying, look, at first flush, that's a, a kind of oddball replacement, but he draws the similarities between their local development in that, of course, the Holden was developed for local conditions, but the Ranger, of course, was also developed in Australia and performs so very well under these conditions and can do everything that the Commodore, uh, the Holden Ute could do and a bit more. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm, now, happy what is I'm happy to dive in here. Go for it. I, I've written about this before, and in fact, wax lyrical on this very podcast about it. One, one of the saddest things, one of the saddest things about the demise of our local manufacturing industry, if you take away, take away the human stories, of course, is the fact that cars like the Holden Ute no longer exist. It's yep. such a unique, um, you know, Australian-made, Australian-designed thing that really no dual cab of, of, of the modern era compares to it, like for like. You know, it was a um, God. They were just so cool, weren't they? And especially when you got up to the Malu level, etc. <laughs> yep. awesome. If you want a car-based you that uh, you know does some stuff but not everything, have a look at the Santa Cruz. <laughs> yeah, the, the Santa Cruz that isn't coming to Australia. Yeah, yeah. well, not yet. You never know. You never know. <laughs> you never know. That is that is the that is the catchphrase of this podcast in many ways. You never know. You never know. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I suppose he's he's just leaning on the indigenous nature of their development yeah, no, I, I, and, yeah. and saying it's it's just so well suited uh, for this country. What do you make of that, Tom? Yeah, it's tough. It's tough. There really is no replacement for the Holden Utes. Um, yeah. You know, the monocoque based, uh, you know, can throw the tools in the back sort of thing. I think the closest thing we get right now is probably a, like a mid-sized wagon, like a Mazda 6, you know, yeah. Octavia wagon, that sort of thing. Uh, but it's still, you know... It, it doesn't have that Aussiness to it, like you know the Ranger does. Yep. Yeah, and I think I think as we said in a previous podcast, it, the Crewman was ahead of its time. Um, mm -hmm. If if uh, you know Holden was around and it was launching a vehicle like the Crewman now, it might do pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, all right, now that is on to our fifth one. Again, a Holden. This time the VF wagon, and Byron's been specific enough to say it's the Evoke, uh, and he wants to replace that with, wait for it, Tom, Skoda Octavia 110 yeah. TSI wagon. And they start from just 31, nearly $32,000 before on-roads costs. And says he makes the point that the sport wagon was such a success. And I'm, I'm not alone in having loved the look of that vehicle. It was so beautifully proportioned. It just looked so right as a wagon. And I'm a bit of a wagon fan. I, I, do, I do like station wagons. Solid, sleek, muscular, five-door, practicality of a wagon, sub 40K pricing. So he's come up with a Skoda. It's, it's in an affordable price uh, bracket. It's got that 1.4-litre um, turbo four-cylinder, eight-speed torque converter auto, and um, he's matched it up as a replacement. What do you guys make of that? I'm going to be very boring here and say I wholeheartedly agree. That feels like that does feel like the uh, like the most suitable replacement and, and another great car. And I am also a wagon fan, so I'm with him. Now you've got to you've got to be transparent here, Tung, um, in terms of what I, lurks in your garage. I have a Skoda wagon, you know, parked in the garage downstairs. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I 100% agree with Byron as well. You know, you want cheap uh, and practical. Uh, get a Skoda Octavia wagon. <laughs> <laughs> okay, very good. All right, now. Lucky last, the WN Caprice. Now, that was the same time frame as VF Commodore, of course, so 2013 to 2017. And he has come out of the clouds with the Kia Carnival Platinum uh, as a replacement for that car. Now, the Caprice was never really a people mover, 
However, yeah. I suppose the carnival has moved or evolved in its latest iteration in such a way that it's maybe not that out of left field. Um, it's, it's, what do you guys think? I, I think there's one very obvious replacement for that car that it's impossible to go past and, and you'll see them parked in much the same places you'll, you'll find the Capri and that's the uh, Genesis G80. Sure, I think. sure. I mean, mm-hmm. that's the car, isn't it? That's what yeah. it's, it's effectively what it's been designed for. Yeah, that's right. And, and look, Byron acknowledges that, uh, but um, he, he goes on to say that it, it's handsome, it's uh, more dynamic than it's been before. It's like a big luxury limo rather than your kind of day-to-day people mover. Mm. Um, it's a great drive, V6 power, brash visual attitude, that it has the, the kind of cred and personality to maybe carry it off. So, yeah, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go out to bat oh. for Byron here. I know a lot of comments are saying, you know, Genesis should be Genesis, should be Genesis. But yep. if you think about it, the carnival kind of does make sense. You know, <laughs> you can you can pick up. Who's saying can... cred? Who is saying cred? <laughs> what? Cred? Oh, I don't know. I mean, it's a great car, the carnival. Don't get me wrong, but I don't think it's dripping in cred. It? <laughs> Depends on your perspective, Chester. Did you say it... cred? No, <laughs> cred. Yeah. Okay. It's getting a little more credibility in terms of it's you, um, a, a bit of prestige attaching to the car. Like it's not just your, oh, the, the kind of polyester family um, unloading at the supermarket car park and it's all yeah. drudgery and it's Groundhog Day and oh, it's more, oh, this is a this has got a little bit of premiumness. I get you wrong. A, it's a lovely car. car. I, I really is a great car and I know it's a fan favourite from plenty of the Cars Guide stuff, but I don't think you're going to be seeing one in the next Fast and the Furious movie. Let's put that <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's got that Listen, maybe, maybe it's the fact that, you know, I'm a, I'm a father now, but uh, every time I see a new Kia Carnival on the road, I look twice. Like, yes. I think it's a fantastic looking car. Yes. And, many- and yes, you know what, Chester? It's got a bit of street cred to it. There, I said it. Has um has your wardrobe modified as well, Tung? You're up on the tracky dax now, and you're yeah. You're, I, I, yeah. I tuck I tuck my polos into my jeans now. Good. I wear them quite high waisted. <laughs> That's good. Uh, yeah, the socks are pulled right up. <laughs> nice. Well, look, that that was a really good discussion. Thank you. And it would be great to get people's thoughts. Um, let us know where you'd be on replacement for Australian-made cars, which are by definition irreplaceable now. Mm-hmm. Um, how would you go about it? What is what are some of your options? But We'll move to our garage where cars that you can continue to buy. Uh, res- oh, well, interesting, though. We're going to start with you, Tung. It's not yeah. exactly an easy purchase. Tell us about what you've been driving. Uh, I Last week, I was lucky enough to sample the second-generation Toyota Mirai, uh, which is, you know, a hydrogen fuel cell electric car. And for those that don't know, um, vehicles like the Mirai, like the uh, Hyundai Nexo, Nexo uh, yeah. they have, uh, you know, a, a fuel cell installed in them. Uh, You put hydrogen in it and that fuel cell kind of extracts electricity out of the hydrogen that powers the electric motors and powers the wheels uh, with the only byproduct being water, essentially. Um, so Which you had a swig of. You you actually had a swig of the tailpipe emitted water, did. didn't you? Yeah. I did. I was brave enough to uh, put a glass down to the tailpipe and have a drink. Um, yeah. It's not it's not great. <laughs> <laughs> It tastes yeah. a bit plasticky. It's like um, it's like if you leave a water bottle in your car on a hot day, and then you okay. come back to it and you take a drink out of it, and it just it just tastes off. But yeah. look, you're, you're still with us, so um, so that's yes. fine. Yeah, for now, for now. Yeah. But um, <laughs> mind you, he has started he has started looking twice at Kia Carnival, so <laughs> well, it has been some sort yeah. of impact. there's been some impact. <laughs> yep, yep. Um, but it's it's an exciting new technology that Toyota are pushing uh, to the forefront. They've built um uh, they've built a refueling station down in Altona. Uh, they've built a, a hydrogen excellence center. So you know uh, the general yep. public schools that sort of thing. If you're interested in, in 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 this powertrain, you can go in and they can um, give you a bit of a tour and to show you the benefits uh, of hydrogen uh, powered cars. Um, it's good. It's good. I, I wish it was more dynamically engaging. The right. Mirai, the review's right. up on carsguide.com.au now, um, but the second generation Mirai it looks fantastic. I think it could it could be a Lexus, you know, yes. from the outside. It could be a Lexus from the inside. Mm. Uh, the powertrain is really, really, really exciting. We need to build more hydrogen refueling stations around the country uh, for this to sort of really take well, off. Well, to- Toyota would be cheering the federal government, I imagine, because um, they- they've put some initiatives in play to yep. enhance hydrogen production locally. Yep. yep, absolutely, absolutely. We've got... Um, 
you know, uh, there's there's a hydrogen refueling station uh, in here and the headquarters up in Sydney. Uh, there are plans to build another one in uh, Melbourne's east in Clayton. Okay. Um, there's so one. there's right. yes, there's one in Canberra. Um, so you know, if if they can get it off the ground, if they can do what Tesla did and kind of like link the east coast of Australia yep. with refueling stations, then yep. you know, it, it has a shot. Because as we've said before, it has all the convenience of a petrol powered. Um, internal combustion engine car in refueling. You know, you ju- you just go in and fill your car up with hydrogen, um, as opposed to actually charging a battery. That's the beauty of it. Absolutely. Yeah, One adding factor I think is that you, even if you link the east coast of Australia, like Tesla did, for example, unlike an EV, if you are away from a Tesla fast charger and you can simply plug into mains, yeah, it takes longer, but you can keep mm-hmm. moving. If you are far away from a hydrogen, right. you know, <laughs> pretty much bang out of luck. But I would say this, I, I, I reckon write it off at your peril because Toyota's talking about hydrogen in the same way they talked about hybrid with the Prius. Yeah. It, it, those, of, those of us who remember that period, we all laughed it off and said, this is, you know, all, all kinds of awful and no one's ever going to want one. Look at today, it dominates the market. So I, I reckon that it, they are sage words, Chesto, because I think... Prius, much as Toyota says it's going to continue on in some way, shape, or form, I think Mirai takes the mantle of yeah. being the icebreaker on, oh, on a new technology. And Toyota has the deep pockets that means it can experiment with all kinds of things and it will be playing a long game um, yeah. with Mirai, yeah. Well, not as long as you think. They're on the record saying, you know, uh, Prius took, what, 20 years before that hybrid okay. technology came to Camry, Corolla, and all that. Uh, they want to bring they, – they want a Mirai in showrooms in the next two or three years that yeah. you can wow. buy Unreal, yes. great, yeah. and they great. reckon it'll, it'll make the. They, they say it'll take the uh, the Prius twenty year journey and, and shorten it to ten years. Mm-hmm. But I, I do think my, my personal view on this, and, and I'm, I obviously will almost certainly be proven wrong, is that the, the hydrogen. I think for me plays more in the heavy duty section segment. For sure, and, yeah. and it be sort of playing more in the urban segment. So I think we'll get a, a mix of technologies, but. You know, none of them will be petrol or diesel, put it that way. <laughs> so no. cool. And, and uh, Tong, just remind us in terms of you can't bowl into the showroom currently, but no. um, if you're very, very uh, observant, you may spot one somewhere because yes. they will be in on the road. They will. Yes, there's 20, there's 20 vehicles uh, in the country of the second generation Mirai. And um, yeah, you can't go in and buy one, but Toyota is leasing them out to select businesses and organisations as a trial to see if hydrogen... A uh, hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicle could work, you know, in their fleets. Uh, right. It's going to be it's going to be pricey though. I think it's uh, it, they do three year leases um, and will cost businesses sixty three thousand dollars. And after that, they have to hand the car back, obviously. Over three years. Wow. And hand it back. Over three years. Yep. Right. Okay. Well, have they put any kind of sticker price on it, Tom? Do you have any idea what it's actually worth? Or no, no, they have not. Uh, but you know, expect it to be north of that price. You know, yeah. I think it's got to be sort of an eighty ninety thousand dollar car you know, out wow. of the showroom just for the technology alone, you know? Yes. Yes, I suppose so. effectively driving your own power station, which is the yeah. really part about uh, hydrogen fuel cells. Hyundai's got one as well, of course, with the Nexo, which I have driven, is also uh, mm-hmm. yes. probably the greatest compliment you can pay it is that it's very car-like in the way that it drives. <laughs> if, um, <laughs> if, I'd, if I'd paid attention in science, I'd understand that voodoo that goes on in the fuel cell, but it is it is pretty brilliant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great, yeah. your own electricity on the road. It's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Okay, now... Thank you very much, Tung. Chesto, moving on to you. Uh, it's also a Toyota, but of a rather different kind. Yes, slightly more old school. So I, I was, uh, well, modern, but old school. So I was on the launch of uh, the, the GR Yaris in, in Portugal, I think it was, or maybe Spain, years and years ago now. And we drove- When you could travel. <laughs> I don't, when you could travel. When you, back when you could travel, yeah. That's not, had, so uh, that's not Portugal, Tasmania. No, no, no. <laughs> Spain, just outside Tamworth. Okay. And uh, they had both there. They had the uh, the regular Yaris, which of course we've all now driven, and they had the hardcore version, which wasn't then called the Rally. I think it was called the Performance Pack. And we drove both around the track, and, and almost everybody there said to Toyota, "Oh, you've got to bring a Performance Pack. It's awesome. Like it's got to come." And they said, "Oh, actually, we're not. We're just bringing the base model. We we think that's enough for Australia, enough for Australian customers. We might look at it down the track, or we might not." Happily, they did look at it sooner rather than later and have now launched what we now know is called the GR Yaris Rally. 
So without rehashing too much of the detail, that basically shares all the good stuff with the GR. So all that, you know, that great engine, um, that custom chassis, everything else, but it adds some cool stuff. So it adds uh, lightweight wheels, Michelin 4S tires, stiffer suspension, and probably the most important part is limited slip discs front and rear, which right. is um, wow. a really cool performance kit for, for a little hot hatch. Uh, and I can tell you, it, it really does make a difference. If, if, you are, if you ever plan on taking your Yaris to a racetrack or a closed road or a hill climb or anything like that, then this is really the one you want. I say it with one caveat though, and that is that I have only, I've driven that car twice now, both times on a racetrack never mm. on a public road yeah and when you hear things like retune stiffer suspension etc it does yeah. make you a bit nervous about how it's going to perform on suburban streets yeah and those fears don't go away when the when the company effectively <laughs> prevents you driving <laughs> but, I, but i reckon if you if you sign on for a car like that you've got yeah. your eyes wide open you I know can't. exactly what you're getting and you're probably loving it you know it you, you've got to be the right person for that car it's a manual only Three door hatch, which will cost you fifty five thousand before you pay the on roads. Yep. So if you walk into that thinking you're going to get a luxury cruiser, you know, yeah. I got bad news for you. But what you are going to get is, is probably, I'm going to go out on something of a limb here. Probably the best non premium performance car you can buy in Australia. Sure. It, wow. It's brilliant. Yeah, it's it brilliant. Is, it is. Oh, that, that that price puts it right up against like Honda Civic Type R. Yeah. So. GR yeah. Yaris Rally better than Civic Type R. Yeah, it's wow. pretty brilliant. It, it is amazing. Yep. Actually, well, to be honest with you, it's been a long time since I've driven a Civic Type R. But anyway, I, I but I would say I think it, I mean, look, the in, in the battle of the looks, the Yaris has got it covered. <laughs> it looks pretty tough. Um, and um, what I was going to say, Chesto, is um, when the the GR Yaris arrived, there was a lot of hubbub about availability, how much supply Toyota in Australia could get. The pricing strategy established it in the place. What's the supply situation now, particularly so, with this rally? Is it is there going to be a stream of them ongoing, or how does it, that work? Interesting, you should say that they've got plenty of orders for both. They uh, they they most of them are going to be delivered this year. Some are going to push into 2022 and even the second half of 2022. So it's quite a long delivery right. process of this vehicle. Yeah, Perda also makes a point. So when you get in the Yaris, every G, the rally that is, every single one has a little plaque saying one of X or number, whatever, right? Which always makes you think, uh oh, this is going to be a very limited run thing. Toyota says no, they they opted to that just to make the customers feel a little bit special. It's, <laughs> it's not limited. Um, it's not a small volume vehicle, and they mm. will, uh, you, you know, they can essentially get as many as they want. It's just going to be a could because of the production is in only in a single facility, obviously, um, and quite a complex production strategy. It's going to take some time to deliver them. The other flip side of the GR Yaris Rally, and you might remember they had this unbelievably confusing pricing structure where if you got in, you know, before the clock struck midnight on the third Sunday of April, you and you were standing on one leg, yeah, yeah. you got it for a dollar fifty, yeah, it, and it was, it was you know a million. So all of that sort of stuff took a lot of money from Toyota to invest in that to subsidize the price to get people into them. They look back at that strategy now and say that it worked perfectly and it did. It created a lot of hype. There was, it's, they sold out in minutes, if you remember. Yep. But all of that was not just about the, the Yaris. It, that was just part of the story. It was about the GR brand, GR, yeah. which we know will soon get followed by cars like Corolla, CHR. And 86. 86. 86 mm, and eventually yep. mm. Hilux. So um, yep. they are going to be a performance powerhouse Toyota. It's really exciting. It's genuinely exciting because Unreal. with the biggest car, biggest and richest car company in the world turns their attention to performance, I, I really yep. am saying that we should all be celebrating. It's Akio it's, Toyota. It's, yeah. it's, it's him. It's from the top. Like we've got to make exciting cars. Um, and and do. they're doing it. They're doing they're it. Really it's great. Assassinated. Does anybody else cringe slightly when he refers to himself as the master driver? Oh, yeah. Totally. <laughs> I, I, I actually go into the fetal position when he starts talking about that. That's a, yeah, that's a, yeah. big, that's a big cringe. Oh, yeah. What's, what strikes me about that marketing uh, strategy that they employed was, you know, GR Yaris wasn't the first GR model. It was Supra. Like, yeah, yes. Yeah, it but was. they opted to not incentivize Supra to, yeah. you know, drop up that brand. But it wasn't yeah. theirs, Tung. That was the thing. Oh, no. so, so when we when we were on that launch, mate, the, the yeah. engineer, no, all joke, like all jokes aside, the engineer was was virtually in tears with emotion, talking about uh, how exciting it was for Toyota to produce a vehicle like the GR Yaris. They just obviously they didn't get that feeling from the eighties. Yeah. yeah, yeah, 
all the super yeah. because they were joint ventures, but this yeah. was their baby, all in house. This is, yeah. this, yeah. in their opinion, this is the first real GR. And it also flows on into the World Rally Championship and yeah. their involvement mm-hmm. there. And it is, it's a massive deal for them. Yeah, huge. Yeah. And, and, all and right. Honestly, guys, if you've ordered one and it hasn't arrived yet, get excited because either yeah. one of them, the base model or the rally, that they are both fabulous cars it's so good for you to confirm that it's an ongoing model and that supply will you know keep on keep on happening that's really good so we can um, see the jc possibly <laughs> <laughs> now uh i will finish off just quickly with a car i've been in but only for a couple of days so it's kind of an initial taste uh, a bmw 430i so coupe and it's the m sport coupe two liter turbo petrol 4 190 kilowatts 400 newton meters Eight-speed auto, rear-wheel drive, just under $90,000, 88900 before you put it on the road. Mm-hmm. And as you'd expect of a BMW and getting into that close to, to 100K-ish area, it's loaded up, three-zone climate, 19-inch alloys, active cruise, leather, really good safety pack, multimedia, 10-speaker audio, all of that stuff. That's kind of cost of entry, I suppose, when you're in there. But the thing that will divide um, people is the look of the car. There's that that grill, which always reminds me of a certain carrot chomping rabbit. Um, it just looks like a big pair of, of teeth in the front. I was standing there looking and just giving it a good hard look, and it. I'm okay with it. I don't. I don't love it, but I don't really uh, dis, dislike the look of this car. It's a bold move. And it may kind of grow over time, but it drives very nicely. It rides mm. super nicely. Um, the four-cylinder doesn't sound, you, you'd want a car in this kind of price bracket. I suppose I'm a bit old school. I would prefer something with a little more resonance through the engine and the exhaust system. It, it sounds very four-cylinder, um, but it's competing with things like an A5 uh, Audi 45, RC 350 Lexus, Merc C300. So it's in... Mm fairly exalted company and I think it does a really good job it's beautifully put together um but I probably reserve a little bit of judgment judgment until I've driven it a bit further but it, it it's what I'm in at the moment yeah okay we should do I, a, um we should do a, a snap audit I reckon of uh JC's <laughs> premium cars fair <laughs> <laughs> Never driven anything for the mainstream family, Tom. What's going oh, on? Yeah, look, JC doesn't JC doesn't drive anything that costs under you know, eighty thousand dollars, right? Eighty thousand, you guys, you're so unfair. <laughs> you're so unfair. We've just the, the the car that we've just bought as our family car is a Corolla. Oh, we good. A Corolla SX Hybrid, <laughs> um, in really? eclectic blue, and it's bloody beautiful. It's so a, what, it's what, was the, what was the purchase experience like, JC? Was there any weights on that car? Or you just uh, yes, there was. We there had was. to wait for that car to be built. So about a two and a half month wait. Wow. Yeah, but, but that was okay. I think some people have had to wait longer than that. Yeah. Um, but the actual, it was good being back in the retail dealer experience again. Yeah. Like went um, incognito and, and just went along for the ride. My significant other was buying the car yeah. um, on behalf of all of us. And it was really good. It was a really good experience. I was kind of in the showroom thinking, oh, they're going to try and close us, you know, on day one and be really heavy handed. It wasn't at all. It was a really pleasant experience. They were really good to deal with. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes, yeah. no, it's good. The joy of working in a Toyota dealership is you can be pretty confident the person's going to come back for day two. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Hey, um, did, you, did you get any uh, like retail discounts? I, I've been hearing sort of anecdotally from customers mm-hmm. at the moment that there's just no such thing as a sticker price discount at the moment. Everyone's paying full retail. No. And look, it, it didn't come up. We weren't going in there looking for any kind of uh, discount on the price. We're happy to pay what the, what the car is listed at. And there weren't any negotiations around, oh, we'll throw in this or we'll throw yep. in that. None of that. We, we were just happy to buy the car at the price that it was advertised at. It was Look, a man, really enough. good experience. I'm keen to know, JC, did the family push for an SUV at all? We, Tung, we went around the houses on this thing. Yeah. Um, at one point, we were in the realm of a dual cab ute. Um, <laughs> we were thinking about a secondhand i3. BMW yes. range yep. extender yep. Um, because there are some just quietly, there are some really good deals to be had on that car. If you're that way inclined, um, a Mazda three came into contention, 
But ultimately, it was the Toyota for all kinds of reasons, basically because the Corolla is a really good car hmm. um, and that hybrid is so economical. The Toyota servicing, like the ownership uh, package is really appealing to servicing is very affordable. And um, yeah, so that that's what tipped it. And um, my wife likes the look of the Corolla and the feel of yeah. it. She's enjoying it thoroughly. Yeah, because yeah, just anecdotally, like talking to friends, family, they don't even consider hatchbacks or sedans right. anymore. You yeah. know, yeah. they just go straight to SUV. I want something high riding. You know, I want that look. I want a, yeah. I want an SUV. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> well, I mean, you guys know the Corolla drives beautifully. It is a yeah. really great drive. It rides so well and it steers so nicely. And my wife enjoys driving. Um, so mm. uh, an SUV doesn't appeal because it is all those things. Okay. Um, our kids are getting a little older now. We don't need the big capacity of, of an SUV. A hatchback's fine and it, it drives really well. So it was the ideal answer. Great. Unreal. Yep. All right. Now, uh, we are going to move to feedback from last week. And uh, our proposition last week, the main discussion was no excuses, bring them here. The cars that we've all been talking about but are denied us for various reasons, primarily because they're not produced in right-hand drive or they just don't make sense financially. We're talking Bronco, uh, Ford Bronco, Kia, Telluride, etc. cetera. Mm -hmm. um, Lofty Visions, our old mate Lofty, mm -hmm. uh, came in and said, <coughs> cough, Outback, XT. <coughs> <laughs> Did you know that every time Subaru fails to release a turbo car in Australia, a kitten dies? Stop murdering kittens, Subaru. Yeah. Um, so he's very keen to see the Outback XT yeah. in this market. Senior Bob, great to have you on board again, Senior. Thank you. Bronco, please, but refined yeah. and econ economical V6 petrol, 2.7 litre turbo or even better, 3.5 twin turbo. He says, he, he lists it off. No DPF, no EGR, no ad blue, no stink, no rattling, no vibrations, no shakes, no complaints from wifey about filling up. Um, and then he says later on, no decoke needed, no catch can, no expensive eco engine oil. Uh, he's, he's going on and on. Um, much cooler than Defender and Wrangler. Put it this way, he is all for it. Yep. And Senior has a deep throat contact in the Aussie Ford retail network. And his mail aligns with Byron's that Bronco is coming once the US market is satisfied, mm -hmm. um, that the Bronco will come here. So I, for one, would love to see that. I'd, yeah. I'd, um, I, I look at buying one. I, I think they're awesome. I think no, they're I think awesome. they look amazing. They look just, they just say, have fun. Just yeah. have some yeah, fun yeah, in this yeah. thing. Totally agree. Um, Grudlin74 uh, welcomes me back. Uh, hopes, he, hopes I had a good time at the Easter show. Richard mentioned um, when he was hosting the show that I was actually working at the Sydney Royal Easter show, operating a ride physically, just, you know, it, it, is, it is a struggle, but um, no, it was great fun as always. Um, and he says that um, he'd heard about the Hyundai Santa Cruz and we didn't mention it and various others jumped in as well and said, surely that's one of the cars that's denied to us, but should be coming here. Um, Jim Danik, for example, said, yeah, he felt the same, but not enough towing capacity. It's not a traditional ute. Even if it was to come here, it's, it's your Brumby style um, lifestyle focused ute. I think it'd do really well. Um, yeah. But, but at, at the moment we're being told that we're not towing that it is still off the agenda for Australia. Still off the agenda, but that doesn't mean that um, you know that uh, SUV-based uh, Ute isn't coming. The Ford yep. have got one uh, in the form of the Maverick, which yep. just like the Bronco, you know, once it satisfies yep. overseas markets, could very well come to Australia. And they, like we say, you never know. Yeah, you exactly. Never know. Um, Cruise, that story is not over. It's purely finances. Yeah. They say they can't get the business case to stack up in Australia at the moment. Production right. cost per sale price. Yep. But uh, but you never. I, I mean, I hate to say it again, but you do never know. They do you never know. It. They just can't. Yeah. Mate, well, right it's here. interesting because Greg Burville went into his local Canberra dealer with a fistful of dollars, apologies <laughs> to Clint Eastwood, um, for an early deposit. And they said, he, he asked, deal or no deal? And they said, so, no, sorry, not coming here. No deal. Um, so he's tried, he's tried to give a dealer some money yeah. and they wouldn't take it from him. But an interesting point raised by Michael McLeaf, who joins us from the US. Mm -hmm. And he says he can't help but wonder whether what impact the US chicken tax has had. Uh, now, are you guys aware of this? Is this, no. is this the uh, trade wars? Yes. Now, I, it was new news to me, uh, but in 19, early 1960s, Lyndon Johnson, the then US president, 
imposed a 25% uh, tax on pickup trucks coming out of certain European countries in retaliation for tariffs on US chicken going to those countries. So it's been called the chicken, chicken tax. And although there've been various workarounds over time, it's still there. Mm. So <laughs> that's, that's what's encouraged various makers like Nissan, for example, to build the Titan in the US um, because they want to avoid the chicken tax. Yep. And yeah. so Michael makes the, the, the valid point that it doesn't make sense for US manufacturers to then turn around and send these cars and make a right-hand drive one for Australia. So he's just wondering whether with the likes of Santa Cruz and Ford Maverick um, won't be offered that uh, because they're being manufactured in the US. Mm. And it's an interesting point. It's mm. definitely possible. I mean, the, the, the thing is that we often forget in Australia is the right-hand market for things like trucks, especially, yeah. is not that big. Mm. So if, you, if you've got a country of hundreds of millions of people oh. to satisfy demand for retail yep. to sell 150 in Australia is a, is a big ask. But what I would say, Chesto, just to, to, to offer the flip side, when you look at a plant like Ford's Rouge plant mm -hmm. um, in Michigan, the sophistication of that plant is amazing. Mm -hmm. And to tweak a few dials and to change a few robots and, and punch out a few right-hand drive F-150s, for example, you've got to think that's more possible than it's ever been or easier than it's been yeah. um, in, in recent times. So, yep, totally fractional, super small market. But by the same token, they have production sophistication. That means it would probably be easier to do than it's been before. Isn't it more a capacity issue, though, than anything else? Isn't, yeah. that, isn't that what Shaw's business model effectively? That the, Good point. The lines are filled with, with customer cars kind of thing? Well, that, that sausage machine is, is pushing out as many F-150s as, as they can because they're selling them all. Yeah. Is um, it yeah, you're right. I think it probably is. Yeah, yeah. All right, and just to finish off the feedback... We had uh, Thunder 250, um, who I think is uh, possibly a younger viewer slash listener, said, hey, guys, my mum and I have been a bit baffled by a new car we've come across. I was hoping you could shed some light on it because there's little or no information on this car I found useful. It's called the Lancer Edition R, and I have a source, I have a picture of the car, um, who supposedly has the only one in the country in a Mitsubishi dealership up here in Queensland. So I'm just wondering if you know much, if anything, about it. And I was able to find out some stuff. Thunder, uh, do, had this um, come across either of you guys? It hadn't, but I'm just reading it now, actually. Yep. So I've never heard of it. Never heard okay. of the Lancer now, Edition R. Edition R. So it's made by Proto Cars uh, by Ditko Sport in Poland. And they're actually on Facebook. And to quote them, they say, our company specializes in designing and building prototype cars for rally and racing. And the edition R was in 2019. And for those on YouTube, we'll have some vision of the car um, up on screen. And it was basically, this one was a kit, no, no major mechanical mods as far as I could determine on the Evo 10 Lancer. And what they've done is modified it quite dramatically. So you get the dynamic shield face on, on the Lancer and a, a different treatment across the rear of the car. And it's got that rally car look. I reckon it's it looks amazing. So it looks awesome. It does look awesome. So uh, that's what we think you've uh, spotted there, Thunder. And it is a very interesting car. And speaking of interesting cars, it is time for Muskwatch. Right, so first up, the automotive elephant in the room in terms of Muskwatch is a Wall Street Journal report on a fatal Tesla crash in Texas where the car was believed to be driverless. So most people will have heard about this. Two men died after a Tesla vehicle that authorities believe was operating without anyone in the driver's seat crashed into a tree uh, just north of Houston. So the police and other responders uh, that, that attended the crash were firmly of the belief that there was one person in the back seat and another person in the passenger seat. And there's subsequently been all kinds of conjecture as to whether or not they ended up there because of the crash or that there was no one in the driver's seat to begin with. And this had been sheeted home to over-reliance on autopilot driver assistance. Um, for example, one of the police people, Harris County, 
uh, precinct said, um, our preliminary investigation is determining, but it's not complete yet, that there was no one at the wheel of that vehicle, the constable said, we're almost 99.9% .9 sure. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know quite what that means, but they, they believe for whatever reason that the, there was no one steering the car. There was also an initial report in the Wall Street Journal that it took roughly 32,000 gallons of water and four hours to put the fire out that it started because the battery kept reigniting. Um, the high voltage, um, you know, gubbins inside the car made putting the fire out uh, very difficult. So this, of course, was a, a pretty big sensational story, which plays into the whole autopilot, full self-driving uh, narrative from Tesla. And various ones stood up and said, look, this is another case of um, over-promising and under-delivering in terms of the technology. But then Elon came out after some silence from Tesla. He came out on Twitter and said that really they knew their logging uh, knew that that car had not purchased full self-driving. So the owner of that car, it did not have full self-driving equipped to it. And others jumped in and said, there are sensors that if the car sensors, no one is sitting in the driver's seat, it won't go, you know? <laughs> so it, it's physically impossible to do these things. So there is a lot of back and forth about um, whether or not this was indeed the case. Mm. It's, uh, I, I'd, I, last thing I want to do is speak ill of anyone here, obviously. And we're, so I'm going to make it more broad. Whether they're in the front seat, passenger seat or back seat, whether you drive a Tesla, a Mercedes, a BMW, an Audi, whatever, there is no technology that exists today that would allow you to not be in front of the steering wheel. Mm -hmm. So no matter what the system's called or what you think it can do, yes, take my word for it, it can't. So yes. For goodness sake, sit behind the wheel and pay attention no matter what's happening. Absolutely. I mean, there was a fellow on Twitter um, called Ahmed A. Dalhat who said, This doesn't, to your point, Chester, he said, This doesn't make sense. There are safety measures in place with the autopilot. Seat is weighted to make sure there is a driver. Hands must be on steering wheel every 10 seconds or it disengages. Autopilot doesn't go over the speed limits. Over the limit is impossible. Research, please. And Elon Musk came in and said, your research as a private individual is better than professionals, Wall Street Journal, exclamation point. Uh, data logs recovered so far show autopilot was not enabled and this car did not purchase FSD. Moreover, standard autopilot would require lane lines to turn on, which mm. this street did not have. Mm. So I think it's just, it feels like the police getting it wrong. Yeah, um, and making an assumption because it was a Tesla car, but there's mm. more. I might say, more. To but, come. Like an easy fix for that is just don't call it autopilot. You know, I know. name autopilot kind well, of implies oh, like yeah. this autonomous ability that is just not there yet. Oh. Um, and Tesla have gotten in trouble in the past. Uh, I think in Germany, off the top of my head, uh, calling this system autopilot. Um, you know, I don't think they're the allowed guys. to call it that. There, I think you're right. No. Yeah. 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 Totally okay. um, and, you know, if autopilot is is dubious, how about full self-driving? You yeah. know, that, yeah. that's paying for full self-driving and that's out there in beta form. It's not full self-driving. So there's all of that uh, discussion to be had. But the, the, the actual what went on with this crash in Texas, I think there'll be more to come. It'll, it it'll sounds be like a, I mean, it's, it's an awful story, don't get me wrong, but it sounds like an incredibly high-speed crash. Yes. At, uh, you know. It, it would surely be difficult to determine, at least from the outset, exactly where everyone was sitting, yep. especially they were thrown from the car, etc. Well, that's true. That goes to a, you know, you'd have to have the discussion about how these crashes are assessed, mm. um, how is a cause determined, and what are the techniques or, you know, specifics of all of that. That that would be a very complex conversation. Or to put it another way, if, if they were driving a 1989 Ford F-150, yep. would they have said no one was driving it? Good point. That, that assumption would never be made, right? Because no. it, yeah. it, that, that technology doesn't no. So if it was a Tesla, perhaps you then start thinking, oh, well, maybe no one was driving. Yeah, that's right. That's right. You almost go there to that as your first assumption. Yeah. Um, well, look, no matter, no matter what you think of that, uh, Matt Farah, which some of our readers and uh, viewers and, and listeners may uh, be aware of uh, via the smoking tyre, uh, he of the smoking tyre fame, he pointed people on Twitter to a particular story written by Nathan J. Robinson, currentaffairs.org. And he was questioning Elon Musk's status as this massive 
global visionary that was going to take humankind in, a, in an altogether better direction mm. under the heading of the story saying, surely we can do better than Elon Musk. <laughs> which was an interesting question to ask when so many people seem to default view him as this, this global leader in terms of where we might go as a, as a species. Yeah. He's, I'll read you the first sentence. Uh, it's a long one, but it sums up his approach. There are two facts that I've sometimes found it difficult to reconcile. The first is that Tesla Inc. makes innovative and genuinely impressive electric vehicles that can hold their own against the fastest performance cars in the world. The second is that the CEO of Tesla Inc. celebrated entrepreneurial genius Elon Musk is a liar, huckster and moron who regularly says things so ignorant that I cannot understand how they can come from a human adult, let alone one treated by his fans as a super genius. <laughs> Not pulling any punches. Musk is a lying, ignorant grifter, and he has inspired innovation in the electric car industry. So he's saying, can you reconcile these two things? Yeah. Um, which is a very interesting question. I'd, I'd recommend people have a read. Um, he also says his takes on the COVID-19 uh, pandemic make Donald Trump look like the Dean of Harvard Medical School. Um, <laughs> and he's basically saying, at one point, Twitter shut down his account, assuming it had been hacked when Musk began posting pictures of manga women with captions like, I'm actually cat girl, here's a selfie. <laughs> this is a 50-year-old man. He's basically saying he has the, the, the kind of sensibilities of a 12-year-old boy. Yeah. Um, and I, I won't go into too much more uh, detail except pulling out that he, he's covered everything that we've kind of touched on in Muskwatch over recent years. Um, the Tesla share price, stupendous. The product, so great. Uh, the disruption that he's caused in the automotive industry and, and others are now reacting. Um, but he, he's also saying he says such dumb things. He's very juvenile. Um, he's a bully, allegedly, in the workplace. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't really um, understand empathy, spontaneous firings and just bursts of, of temper. Um, he's like a spoiled child is, is what this person's saying. Um, he's kind of paranoia. He, he's developed the cyber truck uh, because he sees a, a negative future. You need to protect yourself from the apocalypse and we need to uh, leave, leave Earth and, and go to Mars. He's, he's got a pretty negative, almost paranoid view mm -hmm. um, of the way things are. Um, he says, it makes me deeply sad that Elon Musk is seen by many as our biggest dreamer because it, his dreams are so pitiful. Um, <laughs> Um, you know, it, it, it's kind of provocative. He also talks about something we touched on years ago, which is Silicon Valley's tendency to promise big and then backfill afterwards. Yeah. Like, we're going to get the investors in. We're going to build a lot of hype. And then, geez, I hope we can get there in terms of delivering on these promises. Yeah. Um, and the, the, the same being AM, FM, actual machinery and fucking magic. You know, that's the difference that you're either producing something that that actually works or just the big dream. Yeah. And uh, this person sees uh, Elon as the big dream. And yes, he does deliver on things. That's that's for sure. But um, he's he 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 also makes these big promises that are so difficult to deliver. on. I would add to that and say that he may very well be a dreamer, but aside from driving the, this EV revolution, which he deserves a huge amount of credit for, as does Tesla, for, for really shifting the way people view electric vehicles <clears throat> and really doing the impossible and making them cool when no one else could. Yes. Um, the only problem is he may very well be a dreamer, but I find the rest of his dreams more than a little bit terrifying. I agree. The, from the neuro links to the shooting satellites to the sky to, to, to robotic brains and everything else. Yeah. I, just, I think, yeah, he, he may have big dreams, but they feel a little bit more like nightmares at times, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I suppose the, the proponents would say, look, he has a lot of these ideas. Some of them come off, some don't. It looks like the boring company is going to be a bit of a flop. The Hyperloop didn't happen. They were big ideas. You've got to fail to learn and all of that stuff. And, and that's fair. But the other point made in this article is the idea of genius, um, mm -hmm. even of being smart itself, also needs to be ditched because it implies that if someone is impressive at some narrow task, they're intelligent and thus worth listening to on subjects going beyond their tiny area of expertise. You know, mm -hmm. hence giving forth on all kinds of things from 
coronavirus to how people should be behaving the, the, the whole bit. Um, and he talks a bit about the, uh, the stock price, but it's just a very interesting story. And it mm. kind of pulls together some of the issues that we've been, we've been talking about over the years mm. um, on Muskwatch. So again, it's currentaffairs.org and it's written by Nathan J. Robinson. Surely we can do better than Elon Musk. It's a good read. I'm going to find right. it. Thank you, JC. Okay. Now, the share price, speaking of share price, $732. Um, it was $670 uh, last week, so it's up about 60 bucks. But Yahoo Finance is making a really interesting point. They're saying Tesla, Tesla's US market share was probably close to its peak in 2020. So there's a particular analyst that's saying we've, we've seen peak Tesla and it's behind us uh, yeah, because okay. primarily... Um, the first mover advantage has now gone. Mm -hmm. um, everybody, they've disrupted the market, but all of the big players have woken up and you've got Volkswagen, you've got GM, you've got Ford, you've got everybody mm -hmm. um, getting into the electric vehicle uh, thing, including US-based upstarts like Lucid and, and Rivian that, that we're not so cognizant of mm -hmm. at this point. But um, they're saying you're not going to see those high prices again, which is interesting. And again, time will tell. Yeah. Mind you, we've been, there's a the counter argument to that is we've been saying that for about three years. I oh, know. No. <laughs> and they're oh, just yeah, going up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's true. It's like that's Bitcoin. True. Everyone said, oh, we've seen that. That's the end of Bitcoin. Like, <laughs> we're or Dogecoin that, uh, that uh, the real leaders <laughs> seem so terribly attached to. <laughs> but um, look, at this point, uh, I think we have reached the finish line. Thank you. And I want to say thank you, Tom. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, Chesto. Terrific discussion. Thank you, everyone. And thanks to our ambassador of buzz, social media holic, and herder of helpless people, Mr. Pritchard, for his immense production skills. Today, he's wearing a t shirt saying Fat Elvis Fan Club. He's got Thanos board shorts and sandwich <laughs> shoes. <laughs> they're, um, they're actually wholemeal with caraway seeds, and they, they, they do look quite appealing. Um, let us know your thoughts. You can find Cars Guide on Facebook and Instagram or email us at comments at carsguide.com.au. If you're an Apple podcast listener, please rate and review us. Uh, and remember, you can also watch us on YouTube. And if you are already, make sure you subscribe to the Cars Guide YouTube channel so you can stay on top of all our latest content. But before we go, mate of mine and his wife were woken up 3 a.m., last Sunday, banging on the door. So my mate gets up, goes down, opens it up. There's a stranger, obviously three sheets to the wind, in the doorway, asking for a push. Guy goes, look, it's actually, it's teeming down rain. It's cold. I, no, shuts the door, just goes back upstairs, gets into bed and his wife says, who was that? He says, oh, just, just some drunk guy wants a push. And she said, well, are you going to help him? I said, no, come on. It's three o'clock. It's teeming rain. It's cold. I'm back in bed. I'm not going to help. She said, you should be ashamed of yourself. Don't you remember last year when those two guys helped us out when we broke down? You should go and help him. You should be ashamed of yourself. He goes, oh. Okay, does as he's told, gets up, goes down to the door, opens it up again, and kind of leans out into the darkness and says, are you still there? Just hears... Yes. Do you still need a push? Well, yeah, yes, please. And he says, well, where are you? Just, just over here on the swing. Oh, God. <laughs> certainly, a, uh, certainly a long build up, JC, but I'm just <laughs> not sure it finished quite. <laughs> <laughs>